Hello, everyone. This is Ami Eccles Erwin from FilmFestivalCircuit.com and the assistant director of the Texas Short Film Festival. Uh, right now, we're gearing up for our fall 2023 screening, which is going to take place on October 14th at the Slab Cinema Art House in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, and today, we're talking with one of our participating filmmakers. Uh, John Drusbick is the creator behind Mojave Mirage. John, thank you so much for meeting with me today. Thanks for having me, Xiaomi. Good talk to you. Uh, so, uh, first off, you uh, are the writer, director, and star of the film? Correct. Excellent. Um, this film was a uh, very, like, simple concept I had in my head when I was driving back from Houston, where I live, to Lubbock, which is where I go to college and whatnot. And I had had, in the past, um, like, each summer since high school, I had ideas in my head of, um, these like, feature length ideas I wanted to do, but I never was able to actually um, find a way to actually film it. Totally. And while I was driving back, um, I was thinking, I want to film something this month in Lubbock. And the idea of all of those two or three films I had, you know, mulling in the back of my head for years, it all like squished together into one film. And I was like, I can do this. So, like, the whole outline just came to me, and I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so start to finish from pre-production to post-production, the film was made in 27 days. Wow. Uh, yeah. So I'm pretty proud of that because, you know, most of my films drag on for years. You know, one of my films, <laughs> I, I've got over a terabyte of footage that I have not edited from like 2021. So, you know, I was pretty proud of it um, just for the timing and stuff. Uh, a fun fact is at the time I wasn't dating my girlfriend who I'm dating now. She's the uh, female love interest of the film. Really? And, yeah, yeah. So in the film, I have her, uh, I was actually super nervous to ask her to act in the film. I was in Lubbock and it was summer and everyone was out for the, you know, right. for the summer season, including actors, which is why it's mostly just me. Um, and with her, I was like, I need, I want a female love interest just because I think it's going to be, you know, fitting the film. Right. I've never done a love, I've never done a romance film before because... I just, I have trouble watching other student short filmmakers when they make love romances because it's right. really, really hard to nail it. That's why in The Hobby Mirage, I have as little dialogue as possible with those types of scenes because I know it's difficult to really nail those types of scenes. Oh, totally. um, but I asked her to be in it and she was like, yeah. So literally like when I wasn't in Las Vegas, shooting the Las Vegas section of the film, we were like getting the sunset scene like four nights in a row because it, it took a while to get the sunset just right, you know? Right. Um, if you notice in the film, there's fireworks. Um, yes. And that was done over the course of two nights, actually. One was a Saturday night and the other was the 4th of July. So we got lucky. I was like, we're going to go see the fireworks at this awesome canyon. And we went there and we got fireworks, but it really wasn't that great, you know? Like. <laughs> There was no light on the faces of me oh, okay, yeah. So we had to go back on the 4th of July and get like a different fireworks exhibit. And in the final film, what you see is me splicing together these two evenings into one. Oh, okay. So, yeah. That type of thing happened a lot for the Lubbock scene, where it was shot over the course of two days or whatnot. Um, lots of things were... Uh, like really like filmed all at once because there's three sections to the film. There is Richard, the main character, um, in the past in Las Vegas. Right. There's a section of Richard the Past um in Lubbock with the romance like scenes. And there's Richard in the present, who is uh living also in Lubbock. And because of the way things were just going, like I would film many of those scenes side by side, but it was tricky because each scene was filmed in a much different way. Each each of those three blocks I told you about were filmed differently. Mm. Like for example, Richard in the present, all of the shots were done in 12 millimeter focal length uh, with sharpened, um, there was no like film grain, it was all sharp. It was using my newest sharpest lens I owned. And it was, oh no, no, sorry. Yeah, 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 exactly. So it was doing my newer sharper lenses for Richard in the present with no film grain. And the color grading was a little bit, uh, like lower quality because I wanted it to represent more of like a jagged okay yeah in the moment so like 
when he's walking through the hallway and stuff, the light is clipping a little bit on his face. Uh, the okay. focal length is way wider. The camera is shaking. It doesn't shake in anywhere else in the film. There's not a single camera shake at all, except for the scenes of Richard in the present. But everywhere else, it's like supposed to be a memory. It's supposed to be uh, almost like a cinematic is a bad word, but it's supposed to be like a cinematic right. remembrance of what his memory is. Totally. So like we're using gimbals, we're using tripods, we're using this and that for the scenes of the past. For the scenes of the future, obviously, it's supposed to be like real. So um, I think the color grading is even done. It's like desaturated and it is a little bit green and a little bit more yellow than I would like for it to be, but it fit the scene. So I, I changed the color a little bit. Okay, totally. But yeah, in the past scenes, you know, I add film grain. I added, uh, I was using my vintage lenses. So oh, nice. like I have like $30 lenses from Japan, you know? <laughs> you know the you know the lens I use to help shoot the Batman? Um, oh yeah. I used that lens, it was $44. Oh, so like... <laughs> I got it shipped, I got it shipped to me from Russia uh, I was actually really nervous because the war had just started in Russia right. and I was checking my shipping label and it said it was stuck in Kiev right while the war was oh, starting. No. And I was like, I was like, I'm never getting my lens. <laughs> uh, and then I realized I just ordered it for the month after that I thought I ordered it for. Oh, so good. <laughs> so I think I, I thought I ordered it for like June 14th, but I really ordered it for July 14th. Um, but yeah, I was, I used, um, I did everything I could to make those shots um, colorful, cinematic, uh, more narrow focal length, obviously, because it's supposed to be more in the moment. And my friend in Las Vegas, he was uh, he was great. He, he had like a expensive like ten thousand dollar gimbal that he just brought. We were there for work. Nice. And he was he had his like ten thousand dollar setup with a huge fan, fancy Sony camera and all these things. And I was like, let's use it. Let's use this. So I got really awesome. lucky. Yeah. In the uh, there's a scene where Richard is talking to Carlson, the antagonist of the film. Right. And we're on the Las Vegas Strip. And actually, that was on public property where we were shooting. I was curious how you did place, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The place we were going to originally shoot it was actually on private property, but we didn't realize it because Las Vegas is a little bit weird, you know? Some okay. of it's private, some of it's public. Uh, so they actually kicked us out like, right before we were going to start shooting, which was kind of annoying. But we, you know, we went to a different part of the street. We found the best thing with lighting and we had to wait for the actor to show up and he got there about i think we were going to have him come over around 9 p.m but he was a little bit late and then there was a fake there was a false mass shooting on las vegas boulevard the night we were shooting oh my someone God. threw a rock yeah yeah someone threw a rock at a window and everyone thought it was a bullet because oh, just you know a few years late a few years earlier there was las vegas shooting right so literally while we're getting ready to shoot my friend with his ten thousand dollar gimbal and everything, he is just. We're standing there, and then a cascade of people come running down the strip, oh like a hundred people. And I like run into the street. I dash into a hotel. My friend with his gimbal, he dashed in a different direction. He actually got mad at me. He was like, "You're just gonna leave me out to dry?" And I'm like, "What do you mean? You're supposed to run." <laughs> uh, but we sh we started shooting much later than we intended to, like around eleven thirty or mid midnight or whatever. Wow. <clears throat> yeah but we got it all done in like 20 30 minutes so that's crazy um, i mean i guess shooting yeah. in las vegas on the strip does come with as much uh, energy and excitement as one would expect <laughs> yeah 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 so uh, there's just lots of fun things about the story i mean the film it just fell into my hands honestly like a lot of las vegas scenes were shot last minute last second they were like i need this shot and i just so happened to be in a hotel next to the area steakhouse that was in the right. script oh, okay says, would yeah. you like to meet it? that was actually in the script before i knew i was oh, going to really? be at a hotel yeah i had no clue and then we ended up being at a hotel on like 30th floor in front of the sign and i was like this is perfect <laughs> that's crazy so would you like to ask any questions i kind of just talked a lot and, yeah no that's great well i i love that uh, you put i mean the fact that you put so much specific detail into these different uh scenes and even you know i admire you going back to get the fireworks just right and get the reflection on the faces all that really uh uh works to i mean make this a beautiful film it's beautifully shot and the quality feels so high i wouldn't ever guess that uh this was just a 27 day production uh you know kind of shot on the fly uh in the summer um but it's great to hear so many details about how you got the aesthetic right i'm curious though what did you learn from this process uh i learned it was honestly, I would say the thing I learned the most about was editing because okay. at this point, um, 
this was maybe my 15th short film I'd done. Um, but I had never finished editing like a real narrative film using my black magic camera. So I'd been shooting for about a year, but um, because those projects are bigger, I just hadn't finished editing something. Mm -hmm. And until then, I had never been super proud of my dialogue or my cross cutting between scenes. I always felt really awkward about those types of things. Um, so before, like while I was shooting it, I had no clue how I was gonna cut it. I was nervous. I thought it wouldn't work. I thought it'd be too quick, too slow. I couldn't tell, honestly. Um, like I was, I had a friend of mine compose the music and me and him were like having phone calls like every other night. Um, and, you know, like when he gave me the first batch of music, I was like, I don't know how this is going to fit into it. I, I, I don't really know if I see this. Right. And when I got to editing, it kind of just fell together. I just sat down for a few days and I took parts of the score that he gave me and I moved them to places he didn't expect me to move them to. And I combined two scores together to get the clock at the very oh, okay. end. I remember how there's that, there's that tick, yeah. tick, tick, tick. That's me kind of lazily meshing two scores together. Um, <laughs> it works. I, yeah, I, I, I paid close attention. I made sure he was okay with it. But um, like up until that point, I never had like a smooth transition of scenes that were that. I, I guess it, it feels like it fit together, you know, like, right. For example, when he's when he's in the Lubbock strip and he's on a phone call and he says, no, uh, don't uh, don't go to the area steakhouse. He says right. that um, as we like zoom out, there are fireworks you can hear fireworks in the background the music is starting to queue up and i had a small transition like that for each scene where the music just kind of the sound effects whooshed in and i i never had that before uh, oh, yeah. there were a few I things this i could go back in time i probably would fix okay so I, what was that oh it just the, the, it feels so smooth and those like sound uh, transitions really work Oh, I think your video froze up. Oh, I, I see you now. Were you saying there's something? Yeah, yeah, yours is freezing up too. I didn't. Yeah, yeah, I think we're back. Say something. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you. We're good. We're back. Excellent. Uh, let's see. You're saying that there's something that you uh, did want to fix potentially? Yeah, I mean, honestly, it's never too late to make a remaster. You know, it's never too late to go back and change right. things up, but. Um, the first, I think, hundred people I showed it to, only like four people understood what was actually happening in the plot. And I was like, it's so obvious. It's so, you know, it's so obvious what's happening. Um, but like the only person I think who got it out of like the first like 20 was my brother. And my brother, is, he doesn't watch movies that much. He's not really into filmmaking, but I guess because he knows me, he was like, oh, that's so obvious. This is what happens here. This is what happens here. But no one else really got it. So I was like, if I was going to remaster it, I would um, just add a little bit more depth and conflict and dialogue in each scene. Okay. Uh, it's not too late to add that, but I don't really have any plans on doing it right now. But I don't know. What did you think? Were you able to follow the film? Because that's a good I, 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 I had an idea of what was going on, but I feel like there is something nice about potentially being open-ended. I mean, you don't, you yeah, don't yeah. completely boldly close the door on any answers, but I didn't feel confused like, oh, this doesn't read right. I felt like it read... Uh, correct yeah. for me and I could take yeah. something away from it. The first draft of the film was four minutes long and oh, really? the one that you saw is six minutes long. Um, so I, I did try and extend it by like 20, 50% or whatever, which I did do. Um, and I think that helped a few people, but like there are a few details that just weren't obvious enough. Like the sign mm -hmm. where it says, you have like episodic amnesia, whatever. Right. It didn't show that it was 2023 and that or 2022 in that calendar. So I have a, a close up on the calendar and the right. cut you see. It is a photo. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, those details so just, uh, definitely worked for me. And um, it would be interesting to see uh, when you screen at Texas Short Film Festival, talking to some of the audience, talking to uh, the people there and seeing what their interpretation was. And I, you know, yeah. I think it reads clear to me what happened, but how people interpret, you know, the kind of the details of why those things happened uh, will be different, I imagine. And kind of interesting to hear. Um, I'm wondering, John, what are you working on next? Do you have any more short films in the works right now? Yeah, so since then, I have a terabyte of films, about five short films that I shot. I never edited. That's okay. They're going to get done eventually. Excellent. I actually met a guy who's going to help me edit one of them. Um, but right now, what I'm working on 
uh, I know it sounds kind of bad to say I've already finished those and I've edited them, but I'm working on um, the biggest film I've ever done. Uh, it's going to be inspired by the life of St. Moses the Black. <clears throat> St. Moses the Black was a criminal bandit, robber, thief, murderer, the fourth century, who um, eventually fled to a monastery. And after fleeing to the monastery, he became a priest. Um, and his, his story is that of like extreme humility, forgiveness, and these things. So what I'm going to be doing is in the town of Lubbock, I'll be doing a small modern day adaptation of a small bandit basically uh, taking refuge in the rectory, the church where Moses already lives. Um, and we're going to be basically seeing it from this person's perspective, Stephen. Uh, he's going to go through the same journey and the same process that Moses went through. And um, Moses will be basically walking him there the whole way. Uh, trying to help him out through his spiritual journey. So it's going to be about 20, 25 minutes short film. Um, and it's going to be a big production. I've got church all lined up. I've got actors lined up, locations. I've got an outline for the screenplay done. I'm screenwriting right now. So my plan is to start shooting in uh, January. Okay, so, cool. Yeah, that's that's my big thing. You know, that's, that's wow. a big project that I've been wanting to make for four years now. So that's I'm great. finally getting around to it. Such a cool premise. Mm -hmm. That is exciting, and and it seems like you've shot so many uh, shorts, uh, kind of working up to this. Do you feel confident uh, going on such a bigger, uh, bigger project? Absolutely, I do. Uh, I've not, I've not done enough. Like the thing that's most tricky for me still, and always will be, is just the quality of the writing, the quality of the dialogue for my characters. Oftentimes, I work with people that are either student actors. We're not really super advanced actors, you know? Right. So you have to really pay attention to that when you're writing it so that you don't do anything that's too difficult or too insane for your people to work out. Right. Thankfully, I have two very talented actors who are gonna be leading that film, Moses and Steven. Um, so I'm gonna actually be pushing myself a lot more than I have in the past to really have a lot more um, a lot of dialogue. You know, Moses, there's like four lines of dialogue total and it, it cuts off like that. I'm going to really be pushing myself um, with the help of some people that will be mentoring me through the screenplay and stuff to uh, make it a lot, much, much more character heavy than I've ever done before. So, Excellent. Well, that's so exciting. And it seems like you're making good headway uh, on this. You already have your actors and location lined up. Mm -hmm. Pretty momentum. Well, is there anything else you'd like to add about uh, Mojave Mirage? No, I uh, I remember going through the phases. It's been a, about a year since I finished it. Um, and every three months, I'm like, oh, I love this film so much. It's so great. And then after three months, I'm like, oh, it's so cliche. It's so on the nose, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And, you know, now that it's been a year, now that it's been uh, part of my, it's probably the best film I've made so far still. Um, not, you know, maybe once I finish some of these new ones, it, it, it won't be anymore, but it's mm -hmm. definitely the best uh, short film I've ever made, and I'm very proud of it. So I'm very, I'm just so lucky that so many things fell um, together like that. And I know it's just because of um, the experience I got from making 12 or 15 short films that were nowhere near as good, you know? So just, it, you know, what, what's that phrase where it says, uh, something happens to people, luck happens to people who prepare and uh, do something else. I don't remember, but that totally. that's what I feel happened. So I, I feel like I got lucky and I'm feeling happy that it happened. So. Well, I love that. And that's, that's great. Uh, kind of a great mantra to adopt uh, if you're uh, another independent filmmaker, just to, yeah, like, uh, you know, if you keep working at it, the luck will also follow. Keep working. Man, mm -hmm. I admire the fact that you've shot uh, so many films and now you can move on to this bigger project with confidence. Uh, but Mojave Mirage is great, and uh, all the detailed attention that you put to it does come through. Uh, I think people are really going to love it at the uh, Texas Short Film Festival on October 14th. And uh, I'm excited to hear uh, what people interpret uh, as thank the reason behind the story and uh, what yeah. really happened. But, John, thank you so much for talking with me, and I'm looking forward to uh, your next project as well. Thank you very much. I'll see you around. See ya. Take care. Bye-bye.